Uh, thanks every, thank you, everybody, for coming to the presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Pace, and um, I'm with Building Resource Incorporated. We've been representing BASF wall tight spray foam in Ontario for about 15 years, and working closely with Chris Jansen and the whole team at BASF. Uh, we do the architectural promotion for the product. Um, and uh, Chris Jansen is going to be doing the bulk of the presentation today. And um, of course, he's with BASF Canada. He's the Quality Assurance and Training <coughs> Program Manager for BASF North America. We're going to start off with what is spray foam. Uh, different types of spray foam and where they can kind of be used in different properties. Going to go in a little bit about an air barrier versus vapor barrier because we are talking about air barrier systems. So I do want to kind of put that little definition in there. But I'm not a building science expert, so I'm not going to go in too much detail. There's probably other seminars in here that you can get a lot more information on uh, air barrier versus vapor barrier on that. Um, and then going into how to actually build and inspect and specify a air barrier system using spray polyurethane foam on the exterior of the building. And at the end, we'll show you a couple other applications that are, uh, they're not very common out there, but they are very good applications for spray foam as well too. So, Getting into the chemistry side of things, just very briefly, I am a chemist, so I have done all this stuff before, but I'm not going to bore you with a lot of this stuff. Uh, so spray foam is a high-performance high spray applied insulation, and it's not just an insulation, it provides air sealing, uh, moisture control, condensation control, and the wall assembly. And it's a combination of isocyanate and resin mixing together, and I'll show you the, uh, the, the equipment that the guys use out in the field when they manufacture this stuff just so you have an idea with that. And as you can see on the bottom, it starts off, the isocyanate in the resin starts off, tiny little liquid. They kind of sit there, they're very slowly starting to react, but as soon as you give them energy by mixing them, then all of a sudden the reaction takes off, they start forming the polyurethane polymers, and it goes from the liquid and just expands and balloons up. And that's part of the reason why it's such a good air sealing properly, because it expands at about a 30 to one ratio from the liquid to the finished foam product and it just kind of slides into all those little nooks and crannies that are hard to detail otherwise. So here's, some of the, here's an example of some of the spray foam equipment out there. Um, it's basically, it's a highly customized or highly specialized high, high pressure machine. So this machine will take the chemical from about 20 degrees Celsius, heat it up to 50 degrees Celsius up in the front there. It meters it so it's always a one to one ratio. They have lots of sensors on there that will shut down if it ever goes off ratio. If there's a supply problem from the drums in the back end into the machine or there's blockage in there, it shuts everything down so you're not making off ratio foam on the job site. And the two components are sent through two individual hoses up to the spray gun at the front there. And that's where the actual mixing occurs. So they, they're separate until they get to that spray foam gun. They go through an impingement mixer and then get basically the pressure at about 1,000 PSI. They get thrown out onto the wall and the reaction takes place in about five seconds on the wall. Um, now, one of the key things to always mention on here, and I want to tell you a lot of the, you know, I'm going to mention all these little questions I always get and how to do stuff specially, but the spray foam gun, it's about the size of a fist. So if you're on a job site and you're wondering, oh, I, the guy can just put his spray foam wand on the end of his gun and go spray that area over there, no problem, that's hard to reach. Spray foam installers basically got to be able to get his whole arm into the area so he can see what he can do. Uh, they need to be able to see where they're putting the foam, and there is no wand for high pressure spray foam. It's, it's basically something like that, so the applicator needs to have access to get into that. Uh, on the component side, so basically when the finished product in and of itself, so the actual foam itself, consists of about 50% of it is isocyanate, which is petrochemical base coming out of the uh, Gulf Coast area. Uh, there's four manufacturers of isocyanate in North America, BASF is one of them. And, the, um, and then on the, the resin side, which makes up the other half, that's kind of where a lot of the specialty stuff comes in, which makes it from an open cell to a closed cell, higher density, low density. And that's where all this stuff comes in. So flame retardants pass the uh, flame spray requirements of the building code, blowing agents to make the foam rise up, give it thermal insulation properties, additives to make the foam react. Uh, and then different kinds of polyols, so there's oil-based polyols, renewable polyols that have some recycled content in there, and agricultural-based polyols from sugar sources. Uh, the big thing on the polyols, because there's a lot of stuff there on renewable content, but these polyols, they still have petrochemical bases on them. This is an oil-based product, um, but it's a great use of oil because one drum of oil is going to make, you get you use all that oil to make this fantastic insulation product on there. You're not burning it in your car. So, it is a chemical reaction happening. 
And a spray foam installer should look very similar to that setup there with regards to the proper PPE. So if you're on a job site, the guy is not wearing a fresh air supplied respirator, don't go up to him and tell him to stop. Stay back about 30 feet, tell him, hey, you, you got to put your PPE on. Ministry of Labor knows what these guys are supposed to be wearing, so if they see that, they will call them out on that, make sure they're wearing the proper stuff. Uh, their hands need, be, need to be protected. They should have overalls on, uh, white overalls on. And the whole reason because of this is you're atomizing, they're, they're atomizing the chemical in the gun, so they're exposed to that atomization of the polyurethane. But that polyurethane reacts off the little bits of overspray that they might be exposed to within about an hour. That polyurethane is all reacted off and it's no longer a hazard anymore. So different types of, of, uh, of foam, so there's an open cell spray foam and typically closed cell spray foam. So open cell spray foams, these are your half pound density foams, they use water as a blowing agent, so the water reacts with the isocyanate, produces carbon dioxide and the foam expands about 100 to 1. Um, because it's open cell, it's air permeable, air can kind of move through it, moisture can move through it. So it's got its uses, it's got a lower R value on it. With closed cell spray foams, you use a captive blowing agent. Uh, these are all non-ozone depleting as the whole industry has moved away from ozone depleting. There's still some specs out there that call for uh, CFC free foam. That's from CFCs were phased out in the mid 90s. Uh, HCFCs were phased out in 2010. I got to go through that fun. And the, the, the industry is moving over to HFO technology, which is lower greenhouse warming potential. And we're seeing a phase out of that by 2021. So there are going to be some changes that are happening out there. Some pretty good, exciting stuff for a chemist to go through. So. Um, so again, breaking down a little bit more, so the open cell spray foams, you can see they're around a three and a half to four R value per inch versus closed cell spray foam, they're, they range between five to six and a half per inch. So make sure when you're specking the spray foam, you're specking based on the LTTR for the design value and that the installers or the, the quotations are going out there with regards to if you want an R24, make sure that the foam is being installed to meet that R24. Uh, the density uh, typical for an open cell foam is around that half pound density range. That's kind of how we classify that. Uh, for closed cell spray foam, there's a pretty good range out there in the market from about 1.8 up to 2.5 um, for our product for, off of manufacturer's data sheets. Uh, the standard for closed cell spray foam is called a medium density spray foam standard. Um, and it's actually classifies as a spray foam based on compressive strength. So if you go out and say, spec, ask for a two pound spray foam, there's foams that are less than two pound, but still meet the 705.1 standard, which I'll show you in one of the other slides. So again, don't just say you want two pound spray foam. It's the proper classification is closed cell, medium density spray foam, and you're going to get more, more offers out there. Um, if you go with the lower density product off the manufacturer's data sheet, typically you're going to be using less chemical to get it on the wall. So one, one gallon of material is going to go a little bit farther, make a little bit more spray foam. So there's less uh, product going on the wall there. Because of the closed cell nature of medium density spray foams, uh, they, they make excellent air barrier systems. They can be used very well in an air barrier system when it's detailed. They provide vapor barrier properties. There's very low water absorption on them, so they can be used in a, as a drainage plane. Uh, they can be used on the inside, uh, same with open cell spray foams, but because open cell spray foams can absorb water, you don't want to use them as a continuous insulation on the exterior, but as you're going to be seeing a lot of the pictures later on, Closed cell spray foam works very well as a continuous insulation on the exterior of, of buildings. And also closed cell spray foam strong and when you go and spray it into in between studs or onto a wall, it basically glues everything together. So it actually adds to the structural strength of the wall. Uh, and also you get lead points out of it. I'm not going to go too much into this because I'm not a lead expert. Um, everybody that knows lead is, you know that you don't want me to go into that. <laughs> Uh, exposed foam. So there are a couple things on this one is foam changes colors. You can see nice purple color over here. That's our trademark color. Every foam needs to have its, every manufacturer of medium density foam in Canada needs to have a uh, certain color so that can be identified in the field. BASF uses purple. Uh, the whole point of this is because an architect or specifier or a uh, inspector when they go to a job site, they want to be able to look and see what kind of product it is. So by knowing what color it is, then you know who the manufacturer is of that product. But the color of that surface, I know on our spray foam, in about a day, it goes from a nice bright purple over to a gray color. And that's because the sun's hitting the surface and the like 1 16th of an inch of that spray foam uh, starts getting degraded a little bit. And that color changes from, for us, from purple to gray to kind of a yellowy color within about a week. So 
Don't be shocked if you go to a job site and the color is not what you're expecting. All you need to do is go scratch the surface and you can see who the, what the color of the spray foam is. Uh, spray foam also needs to be covered as a thermoplastic insulation. So as per the building code, it needs to be covered with some sort of thermal barrier depending on your design. So there are limitations as to what kind of buildings these can be going into, especially with combustible construction. But typically behind uh, masonry walls, there's no issues with using spray foam in there. So. Some of the standards used in the industry. So 705.1, this is the material standard. So myself as a chemist and a manufacturer, I look at this standard and see what's the table of properties I need to design my system in order to meet these, uh, meet these standards. Um, the 705.2, this is basically an installation standard. So my installers who I train and uh, use a third party certification organization to basically confirm that these guys are trained and know what they're doing, they need to install the product as per the 705.2. And in that installation standard, there's stuff, what kind of quality control checks they should be doing, how to be a certified installer, uh, substrate preparation, that kind of stuff that the installer needs to be knowledgeable about um, in order to make sure that the spray foam works properly and is used properly in the field. So we'll get a bit into that a little bit later as well too. And then the LTTR standard, so this is, it's about in, in the industry for probably about 10 years now where it's been used. Um, so this is typically used for the design insulation value in buildings. Uh, so it's make sure when you're referencing the R value, look for that LTTR value for the design purposes, not initial R value, not aged R value. Those are typically numbers that are used out of the US. So make sure that you have that LTTR value when you're looking at specification, what kind of thicknesses you're using, because that's a sure sign that it's a Canadian branded foam system. Uh, and then getting into the air barrier side, again, some relatively new standards. So the ULC 741, this is for an air barrier material. And for ULC 742, this is for air barrier assemblies. Uh, I'm not really sure what they're called as a specification on there, because basically it tells how these materials are supposed to be tested uh, and tested together in reference to the building code. So, now I'm going to get into a little bit of building science. Like I said, this is just kind of an introductory because I'm not a building science expert. I know enough to be dangerous, but I also know enough not to try and do too much building science on it. But um, as you guys know, is stuff wants to go from an area of high concentration over to an area of low concentration. Everything wants to be in equilibrium. So heat wants to go inside a building if it's winter time like we are today. Stuff, the heat in the building wants to make its way out. Air in the building wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. Uh, and moisture, your moisture content in here, the relative humidity wants to make its way through the wall and get outside of the building. So everything's going to do that air, area of high pressure over to an area of low concentration on that. Uh, on a vapor drive, so vapor diffusion versus air leakage and why it's different, make sure that vapor barriers and air barriers don't need to be the same thing. A lot of them are very, do the same properties, but Vapor drive moves vapor from an area of high concentration over to an area of low concentration, and it's a slow process. So there's not a lot of moisture, there's not a lot of pressure pushing moisture through the wall. It's basically just straight equil equilibrium process going through the wall, and it does not change the dew point location within that wall because it's just slow vapor moving in there. Now, air leakage though, a lot of that depends on what's happening in that wall assembly, how much air pressure, how much wind is being loaded onto that wall. And because of that, airflow has the ability to move a lot more moisture going through that wall assembly. Um, airflow going into the building because it can bypass the insulation effectively. If it's a permeable insulation, air permeable insulation, air leakage can bypass that, inflation, that insulation to move your dew point within the wall assembly. So even though you have six mil poly as your vapor barrier, if you have air leaking through your wall assembly, if it hits that six mil poly on the warm side, now that poly is going to be cold and you can start getting condensation on there. So vapor barriers, they're materials that prevent water vapor from entering into the wall assembly. And they're always placed on the warm side of the insulation. Um, and so in Canada, it's always placed on the interior side. Um, and it does not need to be continuous because vapor drive is a slow process. It's okay for six mil poly uh, to have holes in it. That's why they're stapling it up and it's not really affecting uh, your vapor drive too much or vapor condensation on there. Now, if you're using six mil poly as your air barrier though, which it can be prescriptively in part nine, now when you go and put holes into that, you're now punching holes into your air barrier. So now instead of vapor going through those holes, which is a slow process, now you're, you have the risk of air going through those staple holes. So it's uh, pretty onious to do six mil poly properly with it being your air barrier system. Um, 
So an air barrier is basically to prevent air from entering into that wall assembly to begin with. And it can be placed anywhere in the building envelope. It doesn't need to be on the warm side of the insulation. It can be anywhere within that building envelope to function as an air barrier. But the continuity is critical, uh, and not just on the wall, but how do you tie it into the foundation assembly? And really importantly, that I've seen a lot of confusion is how do you tie it into the roof assembly? Um, being part of the RCI, I've seen there's, there's a difference in what building envelope consultants with walls, they know what air barrier systems are and how it's supposed to function on the wall, but it's always that transition going from a wall onto a roof, especially when on a job site. Is it the roofer's responsibility or is it the wall guy's responsibility to tie those two systems together? So, yeah, it, that's, so that's one of those critical things that your envelope consultants or architects make sure that that's kind of specified as who's responsible to tie that into. Um, from a water shedding standpoint, it makes a lot more sense for the roofer to tie into the, into the wall membrane because then they're lapping their system down over top of the wall. But. Um, so another thing that moisture is going to do moisture in the air is it's uh, it's going to permeate through porous materials and it's not going to condense in a porous material it's going to condense on the first surface that's solid and below the below the dew point so here you can see there's no poly vapor barrier there's no vapor bar barrier on there so nice warm on the inside cold on the outside about minus 12 so your dew point is typically these kind of conditions is around four degrees celsius so the, any kind of moisture in the air, moisture content is going to move through the walls, going to move through the fibrous insulation. It's not going to condense there. As we know, that dew point is going to be somewhere in that insulation. It's not actually going to condense in there. It's going to condense on the first impermeable material, which is typically the sheathing then, the wood sheathing in this case. So it's going to condense on there. If it's cold enough outside, you're going to get ice forming on that. Um, so how do you reduce moisture and reduce condensation in your wall assemblies? Well, and you can use interior ventilation to reduce the relative humidity. This is something important in pool applications where you're, you're very high relative humidity. Um, you want to ensure that you have an airtight envelope, raise the temperature of that first surface where condensation can occur, and allow drying to the interior of the building. So how does spray foam do all that? So again, here's, we're spraying foam on the outside of the building here. Well, you spray, spray your foam on the outside and use spray foam as a continuous insulation, or you spray it on the inside because it's a vapor barrier, you're increasing that temperature of uh, where that, that first temperature where uh, surface condensation can occur. So now it's always your surface, your first permeable surface is not going to be above your dew point because your insulation's on the outside, everything's nice and warm on the inside where that moisture can hit. Um, it's a seamless air barrier when it's applied on the outside. Uh, the guys just kind of keep on going and makes a nice, everything ties into itself, all the passes. It can provide a secondary drainage plane behind the cavity wall or masonry wall cladding. And it produces an airtight envelope. And because of that airtight envelope, then it reduces the chances of air changing that dew point location. Because it's an air barrier material, the air is not going to move your dew point around in there. Um, again, I'm a chemist. I've done these tests, so the, I wanted to put them in there. Um, some of the stuff that, so the building code defines a vapor barrier uh, under that section. Basically anything less than 60 nanograms uh, per pascal second meter squared is classified as a vapor barrier as per ASTM E96. And it also, the, the code also says where the insulation functions as a vapor barrier, it needs to be thick enough to meet the requirements of the sentence. So with spray foam, medium density spray foams as per our 705.1 standard, any, any 705.1 medium density spray foam in Canada, as long as it's installed at two inches, it's going to classify as a vapor barrier because it's going to be less than 60. Now, to do that actual test, that's what this is. So this is actually from the ASTM test. So basically, they take a metal tray with desiccant in the bottom that absorbs moisture. You put your vapor barrier material on top of the tray, seal it up, and the tray sits in a room at 50% relative humidity and 25 degrees Celsius. And basically, they just weigh the tray. So moisture content from the room is going through your material. The desk within the tray is basically just slowly gaining weight and you just measure it and do a bunch of math and you get your water vapor permeants after about a month or two. Moving into air barrier materials. So two, there's ASTM E2178 and in Canada's ULC S741 standards for air barrier materials. And all this is is taking a one meter by one meter or three foot by three foot specimen. They do a little bit of pressure cycling on it, not a lot, but then they remeasure air leakage at 75 pascal, and if it's less than 0.02 liters per meter second squared, I believe it is, it qualifies as, a air, as an air barrier material. 
Um, so to do that, basically, they just seal the seal it across the top of the chamber, and then they pressurize the chamber to the 75 pascals and just measure air leakage coming out of this chamber. So that's an air barrier material. Now, an air barrier system contains a whole bunch of different air barrier materials to make up the system. So um, it refers to the assembly to provide the continuous barrier. So the, the one, one example somebody told me is basically if you take a pencil and draw it along your wall or along your drawings, your, air, your pencil should never come off for where your air barrier system is going. So you can have different components in there to make up your air barrier system, but they're all a couple different air barrier materials to make up that system. And again, there's two standards in Canada. We're using the ULC 742. In the US, they're using uh, ASTM 2357. Essentially, there are very similar test methods with regards to what it looks like. Uh, the Canadian standard, there's usually a little bit more recycling involved on that. So there's two walls that they test. One is just a solid wall with no openings, but that doesn't look good. This is an eight foot by eight foot wall with openings in it. So uh, square and round conduits, brick ties, windows. So basically everything, in, they're trying to simulate everything that can be happening on a job site. That's what they're simulating in the lab so that you can come up with a design value for what should work as your air barrier system. So there's a lot of detail that goes along with getting your system to work in this, different components involved. And then they go and take that wall and they go and pressurize it up to close to about 160 kilometer per hour winds. So you can see the, see the curve, the, the pressure chart that they use here. They start off lower cycling con conditions and they go and ramp it up towards the end of it to these 160 kilometer per hour winds. And these are, this is enough pressure that uh, 20 gauge stainless uh, galvanized studs, two by six studs uh, with exterior gypsum and spray foam, that's enough to actually flex the wall about half an inch to three quarters of an inch in this test assembly. So this wall is moving as it goes through these pressure cycles. After that's all said and done, they bring their chamber down to about a 75 pascals and measure how much air leakage is happening between the befores and the after be the cycling area and that's what qualifies it as an air barrier system. Uh, to put that into perspective, so that's about a 40 kilometer per hour wind, but it's already gone up to that 160 kilometer per hour wind gusts. Uh, blower door tests that are becoming more common in the residential buildings, those are done at about 50 pascals, and that's equivalent to about a 32 kilometer per hour wind. So getting into how do you build a system with uh, closed cell spray foam, so you need Manufacturers have done some sort of testing to give you some kind of design criteria, some kind of design background. So there's going to be different approved substrates, um, gypsum board, concrete block, poured concrete. Um, there's going to be accessories like caulking and baccarat or compressible insulation for different areas. And I'm going to show you some details of where these things can go. But the big thing other than the spray foam is transition membranes. And transition membranes is actually one of the harder things to do properly in an air barrier system of spray foam, let alone in any kind of air barrier system is putting those peel and stick membranes down properly. Um, so guys that are building envelope consultants walking around, I'm hoping that you'll pick up some tips from me that you'll be able to see guys doing work out there and make sure that they're doing stuff properly. Um, and then of course, the last thing to go on there is a closed cell medium density spray foam. So as a manufacturer, when I'm qualifying different components of an air barrier system, beyond just that air barrier, seven, the ULC 742 test, I do an ASTM 1623 pull test. And basically it takes two bars and you just pull it across. So we have some type of substrate, plywood or uh, exterior glass mat gypsum. We'll put a transition membrane of there of some sort, then two passes of spray foam to make sure we have a pass line in there. And again, as a manufacturer, I'm looking for an adhesion value where it pulls it apart of at least 15 PSI. So that means that I know that my ULC 742 testing where we got 15 PSI in there is going to equate to what we're getting on here. And 15 PSI is a pretty strong number. And that's one of the industry standards. Um, moving into the substrate, so before they even put the transition membrane down on there, you need to make sure that the substrate is properly fastened. So here's some exterior gypsum board. Uh, reading up all the stuff, for, like the specifications from the gypsum board guys, basically they're saying that you need a screw on every stud. And so you should have 16 inch on centers and we can all see the screws down here along the perimeter. And then along the vertical there, you should be able to see a screw every eight inches. So doing the math, there should be seven screws for every stud. Like I said, you can see the screws along here, but uh, I think there's one there. There's one around here, but the rest of the field is, there's no screws in there. So this stuff isn't properly fastened. So this little strip of membrane never should have been applied because the gypsum's not properly fastened yet. And this is a substrate in your wall assembly. So 
that's kind of the first step to make sure that your substrates are properly installed before you start doing your air barrier system on top of that substrate. Uh, kind of continue along with the proper fastening is uh, the screws, they can't be overdriven. So of the three screws I got in this picture, basically one of them is right. The other two are overdriven past that fiberglass sheathing. So essentially they're not really doing anything at that point because they've already broken through that fiberglass, fiberglass mat sheathing on the exterior gypsum and they're not really biting into anything there. Um, and then the boards should be tight. Uh, everyone asks, what's the gap bridging ability of spray foam? So we say typically a, a quarter inch gap bridging ability, and that's what we have here. The main reason for that is because you're, you're spraying the foam onto the wall at about 1,000 PSI, once you start getting more than a quarter inch, the foam's gonna bridge over that more problem, but the foam can start going through those gaps and start going onto the other side of that wall assembly where there could be other trades that can get over spray, get polyurethane sticking to to something or whatever's on the interior of that building. So quarter inch is typically what we recommend. Uh, the joints in the drywall, they don't need to be treated. Basically, the, we have our ULC 742 testing or air leakage testing is with untreated joints, untreated brick ties. The foam will go and wrap all around that stuff and uh, it, it's, it seals up. One of, the, one of the experiences I've seen is making sure that that substrate's dry. Um, so this is an example, this was a building done in this time of year, lots of freeze thaw cycles happening, they didn't have the roof on yet, so there's lots of water going into the building, but there's a full wrap, uh, peel and stick air and vapor barrier on the outside of the building, so they're, oh, they're trying to dry all this, built, all this moisture out of the building, it's basically hitting that vapor barrier on the outside of the sheathing with no insulation, a whole bunch of freeze thaw cycles, and you get condensation and moisture happening in the drywall basically failed on the bottoms there. So it's important with the construction sequencing to make sure that before you make the building vapor tight, that there's not a lot of vapor inside the building that you're trying to dry off anymore. Uh, using concrete block or poured concrete with spray foam, it's actually pretty easy. So this big, huge hole there, spray foam's just gonna fill that up and you're good to go. But if you're putting a full peel and stick membrane or transition membrane over a gap like that, you know, that's, that was about uh, one foot by six inches and about two inches deep roughly. That's got to be flush. So that's got to be filled up with grout or mortar or something before you go and put a transition membrane over top of that because otherwise that's a big unsupported area and it's not going to be protected by any of the membrane manufacturers. There's risk of having condensation potential in behind there um, and delamination in that little area can all of a sudden start ballooning into a bigger area in that building. So. Um, so transition membranes are kind of the next, after the substrate's good, transition membranes is the next component. And they're typically used where there's ever, where there's dissimilar materials. So um, drywall going onto concrete or uh, metal blocks, there's a concrete foundation or concrete floors in between. Um, around window openings, any kind of penetrations going through the wall, that's where you're going to have transition membranes just in case there's any different type of movement happening between the wall and that product. Uh, so transition membranes, these are um, typically SBS modified bitumen membranes. They're 30 mil thick. I like the stuff that's SBS modified. There's a lot of thin film membranes out there right now. Uh, they, they don't work as well on stuff like concrete block with regards to air barrier systems because they're not getting a very full bond. Whereas a nice thick as traditional SBS membranes, they get pressed into the walls. They get a nice surface bond to different textures in the wall there. Um, they come in various widths from 4 inches up to 36 inches and they all, typically the SBS membranes, they all need primers and they're available either in low solvent versions or if you're doing lead points then you're going to want the low solvent version but then your construction needs to happen above 0 degrees Celsius otherwise the low solvent versions don't work. And then they have the high solvent versions which they typically work better. They can work down to low temperatures but you're not going to get your lead points out of that and the guys just got to be a little bit more careful when using them. So I got one of these from a former, former BASF colleague, taught me the five P's of transition membranes. Um, and typically the only one, or the only two that applicators that, transition, that in, membrane installers do are the peel and the place. So we're gonna go through them. So prime substrate. Uh, if you go back to this picture, you can see there's nice green primer extended all beyond all that transition membrane, that means that there's probably primer underneath that membrane. So when you're walking along this job site, if you see primer be extended beyond the membrane, that's a pretty good sign that they use primer everywhere. So you need to prime your substrate. As basically, it's like a paint can, they can use a brush or they can use a roller. 
and then they need patience because that primer needs to dry. So the primer is used to basically tie up any kind of uh, dust, construction dust that's on the substrate that can affect adhesion of the transition membrane onto that. And it just kind of acts like a little bit of a binder, a little bit of a glue on there. But it needs to dry before they go and put the transition membrane in there, and that's where the patience comes in. So here we have a pink transition or pink primer. Um, so this part that's kind of a dull finish, so that's dry, versus this white gloss or this uh, glossy area there, that's still wet primer. And the guys, they should be touching it with their gloves and seeing is it it's still going to stick to their like their finger will stick to it, but the primer won't be stuck on their gloves when they're touching it to make sure that it's dry. And that's actually really hard to do in the winter time because my experience has been that the primers actually have a tendency to freeze before, uh, before they cure. So it takes a little bit longer uh, in the winter for these, uh, low v or these high VOC primers even to, to cure up properly. So, and the primers, they also need to be reapplied every day. So the guy goes and does a whole bunch of area with primer, they're not supposed to leave it exposed overnight. Is they can leave it out there, but then they need to reprime it the next day before they put more membrane down. So there is typically silicon release paper on the back of these uh, on the back of these membranes. That silicon release paper needs to be taken off, and also that silicon release paper it's silicone on it, so it's actually really slippery. So there shouldn't be a whole bunch of it lying down on the ground where the guys are working. They should be taking care of their waste as they go on, so that there's no trip hazards or slip hazards. Um, so again, if they don't take it off, it's not going to stick. And this is a this is a big exaggeration, but there's areas where there's tiny little things. Typically, if the primer is hard, or if the uh, peel and stick paper is hard to peel off the uh, membrane, the membrane's usually more than six months old. So it's been sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, again, that's just characteristic of these membranes is if it's hard to peel that paper off, then uh, everything, then it's just an old membrane. Uh, and then they place the membrane on there. Um, this is the easy part. Everybody thinks they can do this part, but you're gonna see some pictures of stuff that is done really well versus some really bad placements. And again, it's very key that this part is done properly. Uh, here, the guy knows what he's doing because he's using a little trick. So you can take your membrane, something like this. So he basically scored the back of the membrane uh, and peeled off half that release paper so that it's exposed and it's sticky. So that's what he's sticking there. And once he gets that one side done in the corner, he can peel this, the rest of the release paper off and flop it over. And then you're not, the guy's not gonna be having to, because as soon as that membrane touches itself, you can't pull it apart anymore. It's basically, it's, it's, it's a mess. And how many people have seen one of these on a job site? One guy, okay. <laughs> Rob, I was hoping you'd put your hand up. <laughs> so this is a roller. So this is the pressure. So this is the last step in it. And basically, the, the membrane installer should have a roller for their primer and they should have one of these rollers around to press the membrane into the wall. A lot of them will just use their hand and put it on there and think, okay, that's enough pressure, I'm pressing it into the wall there. But they're supposed to actually be using a roller, putting their weight into it, and putting a lot of force into that membrane to roll it into place there. And that's one of the steps that's usually missed. Um, and it's it, not sure why, it's just guys, it's one of those things where the guys are cutting corners, the installers are cutting corners, and they just don't do that. But it's actually easy to inspect for because you should see creases in the transition, in the membranes, if they've been rolled properly. Uh, from a detailing and construction standpoint, uh, here's a basically a window frame and the membrane was designed to basically the detail was designed to bridge this uh, about a two and a half inch gap between the wall and the window frame and go onto the window frame. So now you have this huge unsupported area with the membrane and if the foam goes on there then it's basically it's gonna, you shouldn't put foam onto the window frames to begin with because foams do exert a little bit of pressure as they expand. They can distort window frames or door frames. Uh, if it's not done properly. And also it just creates an easier mode of failure in that point there. And I'll get into why it's doing that. Um, same thing, here's a two inches of XPS on a through wall flashing, a foundation wall detail. So the wall, the membrane's coming down and it's, it bridged over this XPS on there. So primers for these membranes, they'll melt XPS, they'll melt polystyrene insulation. So you can't really put a membrane over top of it, especially in this kind of an area here. So nothing, the membrane's not stuck there. And again, that's a critical area that, that needs to be detailed properly to make sure the spray foam performs there. Uh, if you're gonna do something like that, then you're gonna wanna use metal flashing to basically bridge that membrane over top of that XPS there. No matter what kind of, not just for spray foam, but any type of uh, insulation system where you're using full membrane wraps, you wanna make sure that it's, that's properly detailed with flashing to support that through wall flashing going over that properly. 
and then tenting. Uh, so this is basically what was happening in those other pictures is tenting. So some of the issues that's happening here. So what that is is basically an area unsupported by the membrane. So this is actually a really hard detail to do. This is a through wall flashing detail and it comes, the drywall comes down and the membrane should actually return in along that drywall down this edge, nice sharp 90 degree corners and then come out again. So that's a really hard detail to do. Um, foundation should have been poured differently so that you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But what's happening in that tenting, or what can happen there, so spray foam has a curing strain on it. It goes on, it creates heat, and when it cools down, it's got a little bit of strain on there. And that's why we want that 15 PSI adhesion on the membrane so we don't have to worry about that strain. So if that 15 PSI is basically exerted over a nice flat area, that pressure is going up, that, that membrane's not going anywhere. But if you have a little bit of an air gap, like around that window frame, or a tented membrane, unsupported, now that pressure, instead of pulling it straight up, it's basically, it's doing a peel. So it's no longer an adhesion. It's now starting to peel that membrane back. And very slowly over a course of a couple of weeks, it can all of a sudden stop, start pulling that membrane up. Everybody looks at it, thinks there's something wrong with the spray foam, but it's always because there's some tenting in the membrane there. And there's, there's other tricks to kind of reduce that, that concern. Uh, there's some other tricks from a spray foam application standpoint to, to minimize that effect. So. Um, other defects that you can see walking around the membrane is if there's wrinkles in the membrane, well that's a good sign that that membrane wasn't rolled properly. So if this was rolled, you wouldn't see these bubbles in there, these blisters or these wrinkles. Basically they would look like creases because everything would have been pressed in shape, pressed down in there. Uh, also if you're doing an inspection, you want to make sure that there's enough overlap between the two, the two uh, different sections of transition membrane as they end up with one sheet. There should be a two to three inch overlap between the two membranes to make sure that it's, you keep that uh, continuity there. And that's a very easy, if you can't see it, you can usually run your finger up there and you can feel that overlap very quickly. And then uh, fish mouse. So this is an example of some very, this is a three wall flashing detail and it was ugly. Uh, that was very representative of the, of the project I was on. So they had to redo this whole area. They had to rip that area up. But basically there's fish mouse everywhere here. Their concern with this is usually a three wall flashing that's gonna be done towards the beginning of the job and they're not gonna do any spray foam that for probably a week or two after this goes down because there's additional work that needs to be done with regard before the spray foam rig mobilizes. And so when it's exposed like that, now all of a sudden you can have water running down into there, uh, dust gets collected and it's basically, it's probably gonna fall off even before they have a chance to put the spray foam on there and they're gonna try and stick it down with some PL premium or something like that to get that to work properly. So getting into some of the details and how it should be done, starting off with through wall flashing. So put the transition membrane down on there. Usually these are thicker membranes for the through wall because they're slapping mortar from the bricks onto that. So the membrane, the, uh, the polyethylene film on there is usually a little bit thicker to take the strength of that uh, mortar and the bricks being laid down on there. Um, what we found when we did our air barrier system testing in this detail is without this little bead of caulking in there, we were actually getting air leakage going through there. So we couldn't pressurize the walls. Um, so just by adding this little bit of caulking on the leading edge of that through wall flashing, that allowed us to pressurize the walls, go through that whole cycling up to that 160 kilometer power winds. And just that tiny little detail went from not even being able to run the test to passing the test with flying cutters. Um, spray foam goes down, your mortar mesh, and the brick goes on afterwards. So here's an example of a really good through all flashing detail. So again, like I said, is this, this membrane is going to be out there for a couple weeks, couple days before the spray foam goes onto it. So it's good that they buttered the membrane. Um, that helps keep that leading edge stuck down. And you know, there's wrinkles here, but those have been pressed down into place. So that's been rolled properly, nice tight corners onto that. And as a, as a field guy, chemist, uh, spray foam trainer, it's great to see stuff like that in the field because that's really hard to do. Uh, a guy showing up in a minivan without any kind of prior knowledge, they're not going to be able to do this kind of stuff. So a guy that can do that, he's worth his weight in gold from a membrane applicator standpoint. So getting into some other details, uh, using uh, what is a foam stop. I like foam stops because around windows because that gives a place for the foam to actually terminate, a nice solid point for the foam to terminate. So this is just an example using a pressure treated wood foam stop. So uh, the membrane, transition membrane comes down, goes into the rough opening. 
can install the window whenever they want to. Uh, I guess in this case, they got to be they put some flashing over top of it for the drip edge. Your spray foam goes on, you get some insulation value there, and then you're bricking your lentil over top of the foam, uh, the window head. Um, the next one, a window seal, seal detail, this is pretty straightforward, other than when you get, it's more complicated when they're doing the corners, but my uh, napkin CAD scales aren't strong enough to really detail a corner on that, so I'm just sticking to the easy 2D stuff. So the membrane goes up, goes into the rough opening again before the window's installed. They put a metal foam stop on there, spray foam goes in, window can go in this type of detail, the window can go in whenever, you don't have to worry about sequencing. For the spray foam applicator, this is actually easier because they don't have to worry about pulling off and protecting the windows from overspray. This can be done whenever they want to. Um, then the brick goes up and then the way I'm detailing this is with that foam stop as well. That's basically terminating where the spray foamer applicator's work stops, as it stops at this foam stop. And then the window guy, they can be concerned about how do I seal that window to, to the rest of the wall there. So the, the AST, or sorry, the CSA A440 test, these, I think that's a relatively new standard, but it kind of details, uh, shows details on how to do these windows properly to pass those air barrier system requirements. Um, a spray foam installer is not a window installer, so this helps kind of differentiate where different trades responsibilities lie if it comes to any kind of air leakage or warranty claims in that area. So another alternative window head detail. Uh, this is kind of showing by the book and how to do it versus some of the stuff that can be done in the field. Um, so again, the membrane goes into the rough opening, metal foam stop on there, window goes in whatever. And I'm showing a little bit of flashing on there and the reason for that is then the through wall flashing can come over and it stays supported. A lot of the times what happens here is most of the times this flashing isn't used because it's an extra cost involved. It's not necessary, but if you're showing stuff on paper, this is the kind of stuff as a multinational that we show. Because um, then you're going to have this, un you'll see at the end that there's going to be a small little gap where it's less than a quarter inch unsupported. Uh, one of the critical things here, if you don't use that flashing, is to make sure that the initial transition membrane that goes in here still continues up and beyond. So the through wall flashing membrane that goes, is, you can still see the first blue membrane in this example on the wall before that through wall flashing goes on there. The reason for that is because the spray foam installer, they're going to come in, they're going to spray their foam here, then they're going to lift up this part and spray foam in underneath there. And so that's going to be flapping in the wind for again a month or so before the brick layers come and they finish up that last little detail. That, the last little detail there when they go and basically peel off the rest of the release paper and stick it to their lentil and then put the brick on there. And this is so that when water comes down here, it can drain out before it gets to the window. That's what this through wall flashing detail is there for. But if that blue membrane isn't extended beyond there, then you, you have a risk of air leakage running in between this SBS membrane underneath there because that can crease, that can move around a little bit. So it can create tiny little channels for air to leak through there. And again, if you were to do this type of a detail with that 742 testing up to those 160 kilometer per hour winds, you're not going to be able to pressurize the wall. You're going to get air leakage happening there. So just simply, instead of using a six inch wide roll of membrane there, you should be using a nine or 12 inch wide roll of membrane to make sure that it goes a little bit higher on those windows. So here's an example of some foam stops. So this is where the membrane returned onto the window frame. So by putting the foam stops in there, and these are prime 20 gauge metal, uh, metal foam stops, metal angle basically, and the foam's got a nice place to terminate on there, nice bond to the, uh, to the drywall, nice bond to the prime metal on there, and then it's not st sticking to the window frame. Uh, window jam detail, very straightforward. Put the membrane down, put your foam stop, and another nice thing about using foam stops is now you're mechanically fastening that membrane in place. So if it's another trade that's doing this other than the spray foam contractors guys, then you don't, they don't really need to worry about did they do a good job or not because they're mechanically fastening it. The mechanical fastening of that membrane means that it's going to be stuck and it's going to, be, it's going to stay there. Brick goes on. Um, one of the difficult things to do and difficult things to detail is round penetrations. Uh, so one of the tricks that we teach our guys when they're doing transition membranes is basically taking a uh, six inch strip of blue skin, you cut little dog tails about it. I got some pictures showing that too. And that wraps around the penetration. You take a patch on the bottom, put a patch over top of that, seal the edge with, with uh, compatible caulking. Uh, we're using a blastomeric uh, polyurethane caulking in this case. And then the spray foam, spray foam can go over top of that. So 
breaking it down into pictures, a little bit more detail. So these are basically they take their six inch strip of membrane on the back, they just start cutting little these little dog ears there. Um, and then they wrap the membrane around, they take off this part of the silicone release paper, wrap the membrane around the round penetration. And then they start peeling off, when that's around, then they start peeling off the release paper, paper on the dog ears to make sure that they're getting good adhesion onto the wall there. And then they go and put their patches on to make sure that they have a nice secondary protection on these details. And then there's a caulking, that's, that's it being done on a job site. Uh, I think this one of the last details is expansion joints, any kind of movement joints happening there. So spray foam's rigid, any kind of board foam insulation products are rigid, so they need to be detailed properly around any kind of movement joints. So we'll say that this is our, our movement, so we're going to put a compressible, foam insul or compressible insulation in there. Backer rod, we're going to fill it up with elastomeric caulking over that backer rod, and we'll take a piece of the transition membrane, the peel and stick membranes, uh, put a little uh, dimple on, into it so that it's not sticking to anywhere there. Install our foam stops and then put your spray foam over there before the brick goes on. So this is allowing for these two walls to move independently of each other. So the spray foam is still, you know, your air barrier system now is running through the spray foam, hits this transition membrane and then here's your continuity before it goes on to the next section there below the control joint with, this, with more spray foam insulation. So. Now that we kind of talked about how to build these walls, a little bit about what to, if you're a building envelope consultant or an architect, how, what kind of inspections should you be looking at? So, um, you know, recently I got a small kid, so there were a whole bunch of these uh, kindergarten additions going on within Southern Ontario, where they were building walls with about two or 3,000 square feet of cavity wall insulation that needed spray foam. A 3,000 square foot job, a spray foam applicator can do that in two days. Uh, there's a lot of specifications saying that there should be inspections at 5%, 50%, and 95%. So basically the inspector's on the job the whole time that the guy's supposed to be doing a spray foam application. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So don't just, if you're asking for inspections, don't go based on 5%, 50% completion. You can ask for an inspection of the mock-up so everyone kind of knows what's going on if it's a big wall assembly. Otherwise, if it's, you know, standard construction, less than 25,000 square feet, for us as a manufacturer, we're recommending one inspection for the membrane if it's our air barrier system, one inspection for the spray foam. And then basically that increases for roughly every 25,000 square feet. So just to give you a little bit more idea as to what kind of frequency versus just a 5, 90 and 95% completion rate. Uh, so when, we're, when we have installers installing our CCMC, our fully tested air barrier system, we're asking that they do uh, basically a quality control records or a daily work record. And basically all it is, is it's a checklist to verify that they're installing the product properly, recording what kind of environmental conditions, if it's raining, they weren't out there, uh, installing membrane of the substrate, they should say the substrate was, was dry, they're using the right kind of primer, getting the right kind of overlap on there. So uh, the installer should have some kind of checklist that they're doing stuff properly, what kind of works are, work are they doing, how far do they get, what, uh, what areas of the building did they do that day. Um, some of the responsibilities of the membrane installer is basically they got to verify that the, uh, everything was done per the air barrier guidelines, uh, done as per the assembly, done as per the tested specifications on there, and then filling out the, uh, the work records, the quality control records, if that's what they're doing. Um, uh, again, for our air barrier system, for BASF, we're actually asking that the installers either test the adhesion on site using uh, pull testers, and I'll show you some of that, or that they mechanically fasten the membrane. So, Mechanically fastening, basically the guy's using metal turn bars along that. This, I think this is the first air barrier system that this contractor did in Quebec, so he kind of went overkill on it and has lots of, lots of mechanical fastening on there, but he didn't need to go to that extent on it. And then this is, a, this is basically an adhesion tester. So um, these are readily available. They're basically a load cell on it, and you cut a little disc out, and uh, it's tested as per ASTM D4541, and basically it's for field applied uh, testing of membranes. You glue the disc down and then you start turning the crank. It's got a load cell that tells you how many pounds of force you're pulling onto it. And for us, we're looking for about 15 PSI on that. Uh, and before the spray foam goes down, there should be a final substrate check. The spray foam installer should basically make sure that everything's ready to go. Uh, spray foam shouldn't be used to bury other trades mistakes. Uh, I always tell, our, tell my applicators that uh, go through my training courses, 
make sure that if it doesn't look right, let somebody know, let your boss know, let the general contractor on site know, because if you go and bury somebody else's mistake, then you're kind of taking responsibility for that. But if you know something's not prepared for the spray foam, bring it up, go work at a different part of the building for that. So here's a lot of transition membrane detail that was painstakingly done and pressed and all sorts of stuff. And then uh, they put some metal soffits on, some metal studs on there, and the, the guy installing the studs basically didn't cut properly and went and jammed his metal into the transition membrane there. And all of a sudden there's a path for air leakage through that membrane where there's not supposed to be a hole. So again, make, if, when that kind of stuff is seen, either if you're an envelope consultant, look at what the other trades are doing to that building envelope, make sure it's ready to go and make sure that kind of stuff is called out so that the appropriate trades that whoever installed the metal there, they can correct that. So some of the tricks when spraying transition membranes to make sure that uh, you're reducing that curing strain on there is um, essentially, so the spray foam creates heat and it can create a lot of heat if it's not installed properly. But if the spray foam installer knows what he's doing, he can do little half inch to one inch flash coats over the membrane and just kind of work his, way, work his way around the wall. And you can see it's a very fast reacting system. Um, it expands quite a bit from its liquids phase. It's a really low window or a really tall installer, I'm not sure. <laughs> so this is basically just mimicking the through wall flashing detail on there. And yeah, the installer would just work his way around, do those little half inch flashes on there. And then they come back, they spray the rest of the wall up to whatever the thickness would be, let's say two inches. And then they can come in, there's a gap there. Once everything's cured up, they're done their area, then they can come and basically just tie everything in towards the end of the day. So that reduces all this curing strain that can be on there from the reaction. Now it's not forcing that curing strain onto those membranes or those through all flashing details. Uh, skilled installers can basically figure it out with the depth with um, brick ties. Uh, more, more commonly, guys will just be probing thicknesses with uh, a piece of wire, essentially, with a marking on it. If it's two inches, then they'll have a mark at two inches, and they'll be checking and then just flashing over their depth, their probe holes. So from a spray fold standpoint for quality control, um, they're, they're required as per the application standard, they're required in their train to fill out a daily work record every time they do a job every day. Uh, so this is stuff, what kind of weather conditions, humidity, was it rain, is the substrate dry, is it properly prepared, uh, what density they get with the spray foam, is it adhering properly to the wall. So these are, these are done for every job every day by all the installers. Um, one of the other key things with the 705.2 installation standard is that these installers need to be independent, independently certified. So as a manufacturer, I can train the installers, but I use my certification body to basically independently certify that these guys know what they're doing. So it's a third party. They're accredited to ISO 17024, which basically says that they know how to certify people. Um, and every installer should have some sort of certification card. So this is what my installers, their cards look like. Uh, my favorite guys will lead the former there. Um, any Simpsons, Simpson fans? <laughs> um, but so on a job site, again, if you're an inspector, you see the installer, just ask them, hey, what's your spray foam, spray your ID number. They should be able to give you a number, pull a card out and show you that their card is saying that they're certified. This is basically their driver's license for spray foam. And on their card, there should be a method on how to check with the certification body to make sure that their certification is up to date. So here it's uh, basically a QR code you can scan with a smartphone, goes to a website for that applicator and gives you a check mark or an X basically. So, so with that, I'll turn it over to Michael, talk a little bit more about uh, different applications and different projects there. So Chris did the bulk of the presentation and uh, thank you, Chris. It was excellent. I, always, I learn something new every time I see your presentation. Um, I'm just here to show you where to use it and maybe give you an idea of uh, some takeaways, some resources that we might be able to offer. So, um, of course, you can use it in all sorts of different areas, in cavity wall, whether it be in residential or commercial, but if you're putting all the insulation outside of the substrate, you can use it there. You don't need to use a full membrane wrap, as Chris mentioned. You can use our air barrier system, where you're just using transition membrane and then the wall tight, and this is giving you air control, vapor control, thermal control, and uh, also a drainage plane. 
Um, compared to other systems that you're familiar with where you have, have a full wrap, uh, our system is much simpler. I'm not going to go through it all. I think everybody knows all the steps. There's five or six or seven steps even depending on how you're doing it and a lot of things that need to be done right to make this full wrap system work really well. With our system, there's very few steps. Basically a lot less membrane, so a lot less primer, and then the wall tight basically does, uh, takes the place of many of, those, many of those products you saw on the previous slide. So it's a lot simpler, it's a lot faster. We've heard general contractors say it's three to, three to five times as fast as using the traditional system. So we're the friend of general contractors, and we're also, we're also giving good performance, and it's also very competitively priced. Uh, there's an example of a uh, job that's Woodstock Hospital, and I think there are around 150,000 brick ties on that job. And because we're using wall tight here, we didn't need to detail every brick tie. Uh, you can also use it on either side of the sheathing. And this is a system we see in retail. We do a lot of banks, namely Scotiabank. We've done some CIBCs. And also retail, where they, the floor space is at a premium. So they're trying to make their walls a bit thinner, free up a bit of floor space. They can make more money on their lease. So we say, OK, fine, put about one or two, possibly three inches on the outside as continuous insulation knowing that that's going to be really effective because it is continuous, and then put the balance between the studs to get up to this, the code required R value. So this is perfectly a legitimate way of using spray foam. We've been doing this for over 10 years. It works well in that environment. So it makes a thinner wall. It's better, of course, to put all the insulation outside of the sheathing, all continuous, but in, in retail, they want to max out that floor space. So this makes sense. Um, and then on the interior of precast panels, interior of spandrel panels, and curtain wall and window wall systems, we've done a lot of that over the years, so interior applications. Uh, knowing that when you do this, the foam always has to be protected from the interior environment by a layer of drywall or a spray applied thermal barrier. You should never be able to go into any building where spray foam has been used on the inside and actually see any spray foam. It has to be covered by drywall or a thermal barrier to meet building code. So there's an example that's just uh, at Young and Bloor, just uh, four kilometers from here. The entire interior of all that precast is insulated with wall tight, three inches thick. Um, underside of uh, cantilevers or parking uh, garage ceilings. Again, you can apply it overhead. It will bond to the concrete and will stay, stay in place. It'll stay put. But you do need to in include a uh, spray applied thermal barrier to protect it again from ignition. And below grade applications on the exterior or foundation walls, you can apply it to those walls and backfill against it. It's uh, not going to be affected by being buried or by the, it has very low moisture absorption. And in fact, it's very comparable in terms of moisture absorption and, and compressive strength to extruded polystyrene. Chemically, it's different. It's a polyurethane, but the physical properties are very similar to polystyrene, extruded polystyrene. Thanks, James. Um, actually, it does, does not take the place of the waterproofing membrane. So if your water table or your water situation is such that you need a waterproof membrane, apply that first, and then apply the wall tight over it. If, the, if you're using like right, uh, gran, uh, granular B, like a regular backfill, then you don't necessarily need protection board. It's quite durable. It's 30 PSI, so it's quite durable. If you're using parent, like reusing fill that was excavated from the site, there's boulders and such, you want to protect it. Yes, the yeah, blue skin, we sprayed, a, we sprayed a blue skin. In fact, one of the resources we have on our website is basically a list of all the membranes that we've tested, membranes and substrates. So it includes den glo dense gloss gold, glass rock, blue skin, Suprema's equivalent, all the products we've membranes, tested. Membranes without a face. Though. That's right, polyethylene right. faced. Right. That's right, polyethylene faced uh -huh. uh, SBS mod bits. Yeah, the sanded are better, but we bond to the polyethylene faced as well. So there's the exterior of a, uh, this is a school in Alliston where we insulated the outside of the foundation walls and also the inside of the foundation walls underneath the floor of the building and all the above grade walls. Uh, so there's the um, application directly to granular subgrade prepared and then concrete's poured over it. There's an image of um, them pouring concrete over the, uh, the wall tight. So they can walk on top of the like, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah, it's very much the same compressive strength as Dow extruded SM. 
for instance. What's the benefit then over shooting in this application? I wouldn't see. In this application? You could eliminate the need to use a separate polyethylene vapor barrier and the extruded. So you're taking two products out and using one product as a replacement. And um, it's more stable. So your subgrade is typically not prepared perfectly smooth. And if you're putting a rigid insulation board on it and walking on it, you're mo the boards are moving around. They could crack. It's not very stable. When you apply the wall tight this way or spray foam this way, it creates a kind of an insulated mud slab, if you will. Yeah, there's a in, there's the wall tight, then the in floor hydronic system, and then the concrete's going on top. So yeah. Pardon me. The negative points of it. Um, well, the general contractor could just buy extruded and put it down at their leisure. With our product, they need to be they need to schedule one of our installers to be there and give them a good enough area to work in. So if the job's a decent size, then this makes a lot of sense. I think if it's more than, I don't know, 5,000 square feet, it probably makes a lot of sense. If it's sort of fussy areas, they might opt for the board option. Sorry, just a completion here. So you mentioned that we don't need to have vapor barrier anymore. You can go apply directly on gravel. But on the edges, we need to still have them and break the something from them, right? On the edges here, you bring it right up the side. If that was a, so that okay? yeah, you can bring it up and make it continuous. So you're tanking the floor. Um, but if you have penetrations, I didn't answer your question earlier. If you have penetrations, we do have details showing you how to seal those penetrations using sealant and or peelant stick membrane, similar to the air barrier system. And basically you're doing an air barrier system on, on grain here, on the floor. Yeah. So those are just some uses that you might have um, already been aware of, but hopefully some new ones as well. So the takeaways. Um, we hope, we hope you're leaving here knowing that uh, closed cell spray foam can take the place of these more onerous systems where you need a full membrane and uh, separate board stock insulation. It's a viable alternative. It's been done since the late 80s, this type of system, so it has a long track record. Um, there's also many other uses in the building, as I showed just now, below grade and on grade and such. And also quality assurance, because the product is site manufactured, having quality assurance, Chris's team, and people like that to support our contractors in the field, you know, because this product is site manufactured, that's really critical to the performance. It's also very important that you choose a qualified applicator. You know, if you get a price of $300,000 for spray foam for, from two contractors and somebody else is at $200,000, there's definitely something wrong with that picture. You definitely do not want to give it to the lowest bid necessarily without scrutinizing it. Yes. Uh, compartment, compartmentalization. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what happens in most cases when we are using a spray foam, we are specifying another layer of sheeting in front of the spray foam to, uh, so we are not exposing the combustible material. So, uh, so we don't need to provide fireproofing or fire stopping through that one. Having that second layer of sheeting, uh, is that going to create kind of a problem with condensation because we are creating one sheeting, then air barrier, vapor barrier, vapor barrier, air barrier, and then we have another layer of sheeting, and then we have the exterior cladding material. No, I don't. The second layer is not going to create any kind of moisture trapping or. No, because it's not really, number one, it's not really going to get exposed to humid air from the interior because the foam is in the way of that. And it's, um, yeah, no, I don't, it's going to be basically at, a, at the same temperature and conditions as the exterior air. So no, I don't think that would be an issue. You probably need to put a uh, drainage plane material onto the surface That's of that sheathing. Because most of the contractor wants to cover the, the joints with membrane to just make sure that the, the water doesn't get inside. It doesn't matter the water gets inside, it's more air pressure to get inside. Yeah, depending on the way your system's designed and how it's designed to drain, where the rain screen cavity is, if it's between the sheathing and the cladding, then you'll want to put a, um, a drainage plane material onto the sheathing, a continuous drainage plane. Breathable. Yeah, usually the, the rain is going to happen behind the spray foam material. Okay. Oh, or behind the sheathing. Yeah, behind the sheathing, behind the spray foam material. Okay. 
So um, as far as proper detailing and such goes, we can help you with that. If you're looking at using this system for any of these applications, let us know. We have guide specifications, we have details, and we can also help you with your existing details and specifications to, uh, to make sure that you get exactly what you're looking for here in the wave and air barrier system. So we appreciate your attention. Uh, Chris, as I said, Chris did 99% of the work here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for attending.